is not always better. So says who? Me. What I said. How you know it? Well, I'm going to prove it. Some of the finest things in life come in small packages. Precious metals, such as gold, usually come in small packages, right? I suppose you could get a package as big as this pulpit full of gold. I haven't seen one. Maybe you have, but that could be. Precious stones, such as diamonds, often come in small packages. I guess when they go dig a diamond out of the rock or wherever they get it, they may be one this big. I have seen one. Maybe you have. Precious comments, such as a card from a loved one, usually come in small packages. I guess you could get a card this big. I don't know if I've seen one. But do you understand? Bigger is not always better. Some of the finest things in life come in small packages. Second John contains only 13 verses and 298 words. But it's more precious than any chunk of gold you ever got. It's more precious than however big the diamond is on your finger or around your neck or in your ear holes or whatever. It's more precious than all that. Sometimes it seems that we may think that the, the great big books of the Bible, the Isaiahs and the Jeremiahs and the Matthews and the book of Acts and things like that, they, they tend to get all the glory and rightfully so. But don't forget about 2 John. Don't think just because 2 John is one chapter, 13 verses and 298 words that it's not worthy to be studied. That's far, far, far from the truth. Going through every book of the Bible, tonight we've made it to 2 John, and that's where we'll be pretty much. 2 and 3 John are the two shortest epistles of the New Testament. For that matter, they're the two shortest books of the entire Bible. Someone may ask you, well, <clears throat> what's the shortest book of the Bible? I've looked at a couple of different things, and you'll get one of two answers, either 2 John or 3 John. Well, which one is the shortest? 2 John has less verses. It has 13 verses. But it has more words. 3 John actually has, even though it has 14 verses, it has four less words. So which one is the shortest? Well, which way are you counting? Are you counting by verses or are you counting by words? You'll probably remember that. I'll give you a breakdown of 2 John. Even though it's 13 verses, or verses 1 through 6, we'll see the declaration. <laughs> verses 7 through 11, we'll see the deceivers. And then verses 12 and 13, we'll see the desire. Declaration, deceivers, desire, and incidentally, that's not the three points of the sermon. That would be too simple. What we're going to do tonight, we're going to talk about walking in truth. We're going to look at 2 John and three, see three things tonight in regard to walking in truth. And in the first place, walking in truth means living God's commandments. Number two, walking in truth means loving one another. And then number three, walking in truth means learning to improve. There's a lot that we can learn from 2 John. So let's get started. Number one, walking in truth means living God's commandments. Let's look at 1 John verse 1. We'll read on down through verse 4. The Bible says, The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. Verse 3. Grace be with you, mercy and peace, from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Verse 4. I rejoiced greatly, that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. Now in the Bible, the word walk in its various forms is found all in almost 400 verses. And probably a substantial amount of those verses, it means to put one foot in front of the other and go this way, you know, or whatever way you're going. It can literally mean to walk. But oftentimes throughout the Bible, the word walk means to live. It means to behave in such a way, whether that way is good or bad. Now, did you observe what verse 4 says? 
John the Apostle most likely found of this woman's children. Now, was this woman a specific woman or was that a figurative way to describe a congregation of the Lord's people? We'll talk about that Wednesday. But whatever it was, John found some people walking in truth. That is, they were living in truth. Now, in order to live in truth, we have to live according to God's commandments. Don't we want to be pleasing to the Father? Well, indeed we do. Now, some may feel that God's commandments are burdensome. Is it a burden to assemble on the first day of the week three times? Is that grievous? Is that burdensome? I don't think so. Maybe you should do, but it's really not that bad when you think about it. Now, in regard to any and every commandment of God, God knows what is best for us, doesn't he? God is our Father. You remember the old TV show, probably like me, Father Knows Best? Does God the Father know what's best for us? Indeed he does. Then we need to live his commandments. When God tells us that we ought to do a certain thing or a certain action, we do it because he said so. And he told us to do so because it is best for us. It's that simple, brethren. That's not hard. Someone said and estimated that there are over 1,000 direct commands in the New Testament. I'd buy that. That sounds reasonable. Now, which one of those can we intentionally disobey? Which one of those can we say, that doesn't apply to me? I don't have to obey that. Why would I do that? Well, because you want to be found walking in truth. And if you're going to be found walking in truth, we're going to have to be found living God's commandments. Walking in truth is not a one-time and done-for-all-time action. It is a lifestyle. Let's go back and look at some of John's other writings. Let's look in 1 John 5 here. We may have to turn a page or so back. 1 John 5, verses 2 and 3. Is it difficult to live God's commandments? Whatever one it is. Is it difficult? It's indeed not. Look at 1 John 5, 2. By this... We know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Which ones do we need to keep? All of them. The whole. Verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and look at what John says. This is an inspired statement from the Holy Spirit but it's through the Apostle John. And his commandments are not grievous. It's not whatever God tells us to do, whatever God commands us to do on the pages of the New Testament, it's not bad. It's not grievous. It's not burdensome. It's not painful. While we know there are no apostles of Christ walking on earth today, wouldn't it be something if an apostle of Christ just wandered in here and reported that he found us walking in truth. Wouldn't you want to hear that? I think so. So walking in truth means in the first place living God's commandments. Now number two. Walking in truth means loving one another. Look at 2 John 5. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we what? love one another. There are different kinds or forms of love. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but the one John has under consideration is a learned love. It is a purposed love. It is a committed love. It is a sacrificial love. It is love that acts in harmony with the scriptures. Do you know what, brethren? When we totally, absolutely, as a brotherhood, as a congregation, as individuals, however you want to look at it, when we will finally love scripturally, totally, the way God tells us, we'll change the world. We'll change the world. We'll set the world right side up again. 
the apostles did that. They were accused of turning the world upside down, but they actually missed it. They turned the world right side up. And you know what it takes to do that? It takes scriptural love. We have to learn what that means. Never doubt the power of genuine love expressed in genuine ways. I see it and I understand it more now than I did when I was younger. And maybe if the Lord blesses me to where I live to be even older, I'll see it even more clearly. People need to be loved. It's very plain. Most time you see people acting hateful, they're acting awful, they're talking awful. Do you know why? You can say whatever you want because people don't feel loved. Now that may seem funny, but that's really what it boils down to. Some may feel that loving one another simply means avoiding one another. <laughs> but that's not what it means. I love you so much, I'm just going to avoid you. Well, where does the Bible teach that? <laughs> where does the Bible teach that? It doesn't. It doesn't at all. God knows what's best for man is creation. Thus, when God says through the inspired Apostle John that we're to love one another, we need to do it. Why did God tell us to do it? Because it's best for us. Why do we need to be reminded of it? Because it's easy to be hateful. That's simple. I mean, that doesn't, sometimes that's just the way we learned and, and grew up in life. That's the easy way. The difficult way sometimes is the loving way. Will we be found walking in love if we bite and devour each other? Will we be found walking in love, arguing over things that are petty, useless? Remember what was said. Whether this is a, a specific woman or whether it is a congregation of the Lord's people, John found her children walking in truth. Walking in truth means loving one another. Loving one another is a part of walking in truth. If you don't walk in love, guess what? You're not walking in truth. Period. It's that simple. Let me show you some of what is contained in the book of John. Though John is not the author of this statement, Jesus is. Look in John 13. John wrote it, but Jesus said it. Look at John 13, beginning in verse 34. Are we going to set the world right side up or not? There's one key thing. There are several key things, but one principal thing that the world watches us. And they're looking. And they can see this sometimes more clearly than we can, whether we love one another or whether we don't. Listen to what Jesus says in John 13, 34. <clears throat> A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Now look at verse 35. Jesus says, by this. By this what? By this fervent love that the apostles were to have one for another. In what degree? To the same degree that Jesus loved them. They were to love one another. Now do we not follow the apostles' doctrine? Yeah, so if they were to love one another as Christ had loved them and they set us that example... What must we do? We must love one another like Jesus loved the apostles. By this, their fervent love one to another, shall all men know that ye are my disciples if, that big little word in the Bible, if ye have love one to another. Though there are no apostles of Christ on the earth at this time, if one were to wander in here, would he wander back off and say, listen, I found a bunch that's walking in truth. How do you know they're walking in truth? Because they love one another. Number two, walking in truth means loving one another. Now number three, let's go back to 2 John. Walking in truth in the third place means learning to improve. It's a sad day. When God's children give up. It's a sad day. When God's children give up. Look at verse 6. Now all of us need to recognize. There's room for improvement. We have to learn to improve. 2 John 6. And this is love that we walk. After his commandments. This is the commandment. That as ye have 
heard, have heard, have heard. From the beginning, ye should walk in it. Brethren, we need reminded of certain things from time to time. And when those reminders are given, that shows that there's room for improvement. If the apostles needed to be reminded of some things, if they had some areas in which they needed to improve, where am I? Where are we? Friend, we have to learn how to improve. Now listen, defeat is always on the horizon. There's always a reason to quit. There's always a reason to throw in the towel, don't. Okay? The devil is always just around the corner. We know that. And with the devil being just around the corner, he's looking to devour us. He's looking to overwhelm us. He's looking to cause us even more grief. So what must we do? Friend, we must be sharper than a razor blade. We got to be sharp. And specifically, we need to be sharp-minded. We need to be sharp-minded to the Scripture. I'd hate to think that some in here feel they have the patent on the knowledge of the scriptures. That they wrote the book on all there is to know about the Bible. Surely nobody would say that. Surely nobody would say out loud, I've studied so much I don't need to study anymore. The devil's about to get you. He's about to choke your life out. You better watch out. There's always room to improve, and we need to learn how to improve, how to improve. Do you know that a day off spiritually can lead to an eternity in hell? You don't take a day off from being a Christian. You can take a day off from digging a ditch. You can take a day off from mowing a yard. You can take a day off from scrubbing dishes. I don't care what it is, teaching school, whatever it may be. You can take a day off from that. But you cannot take a day off from being a Christian. You cannot take a day off and say, boys, I'm going to just coast through 2015. That won't work. That will not work. We have to be sharper mentally than a razor blade. Now, some feel that they know everything that there is to know. I'm telling you, you don't. I know some preachers who think that since they've been preachers for 40 and 50 years, they don't need to study anymore. They're pathetic. They're pitiful. And I've told them that. That's just what it is. That's why, to a certain extent, I respect James Rogers. It is obvious with James Rogers. That man studies like he did when he was 20 years old. And if he lives to be 100, I can all but guarantee you that man will stay that way. James is very rare. A lot of you older preachers have given up. And they think, boys, I know it. Now, in the same manner, some of the older members of the Lord's church are no different. They've given up. They say, boys, I've heard this. I know this. Be careful. You take a day off from being a Christian, you might lift up your eyes in hell. Be very careful. Be sober. Be vigilant for your adversary, the devil. As a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. Now some think they know it all. And then some others think, well, I can't learn anything. I'm 150,000 years old. My brain quit working 75,000 years ago. And I can't learn anything. I'm telling you that's not true. That's untrue. If you so desire, you can learn until you die. And that's saying you live 60, 80, 90 years even. And the Lord blesses you with a sound mind. We can always improve. We have to learn to improve. Why? Because that's part of walking in truth. That's part of living the gospel is learning to improve. Don't be defeated. But don't be deceived. Don't be defeated. Don't think that you can't. You can. But don't be deceived into thinking you know everything you need to know. You don't. And neither do I. And if the Lord lets me live till I'm 80 years old, I still won't know it all. 
If I live to be 100 years old, I still won't know it all. The Bible's designed that way. Learning to improve is not a one and done action. It's a lifestyle. I want you to look at me in John chapter 12. Keep this in mind. Some sobering words here. Some cold water in the face. Ever had cold water poured in your face while you're sleeping? You ever had any deviant cousins or brother or sister who were deviant? You did. They'll find a way to do something awful like that. It'll get your attention. The Bible will get your attention. Listen to what Jesus says in John 12 beginning in verse 48. Jesus says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now that should be sober news right there. Look at verse 49. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. <clears throat> Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. You think Jesus took a day off from being the Savior of the world? You think Jesus takes a day off in heaven making intercession at the right hand of the Father for me, for you? You think he just says, boys, I, I need to call in today. I don't feel good. Well... You call in today, for example, and miss your work, that's what it is, but you can't call in and take a day off from being a Christian. That one day off may cost you all eternity. Keep your mind sharp. What have we talked about tonight? Walking in truth. Beggar's not always better. Great things come in small packages sometimes. Second John is a great book, and we'll see more of that as time progresses. You can walk in truth. Walking in truth is possible. We can understand, implement, and, in, and apply the truth right now, even tonight. Truth is a small word, but it's very precious. Do you know you've obeyed the truth of the gospel? Well, you can. i got to give you some bad news. Bad news is Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Principle of qualification will not allow that to include infants, babies, and children who are under the age of accountability, whatever that age may be. But I can look across here and see a lot of grown adults. I see a lot of what the Bible calls hoary heads, gray-headed people. You're accountable. And if you haven't obeyed the Lord's gospel, if you haven't touched the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb, you're lost. And the reason you're lost is because of S-I-N, sin. But I can give you some good news too. I'll give you some more bad news and then good news in Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. Death is separation. You die in sin, you are separated from God Almighty for eternity. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is extending the offer of eternal life right now. What must I do to accept his gift? What must I do? Hear the truth, Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Believe that truth. Accept it. Have confidence. Trust in it. By that evidence, Acts 16, 31. Brought him out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thine house. You will not find the word only or alone there. We believe you have to believe. What else does the Bible teach? Acts 17, 30. You must repent. Change your mind. When the Bible condemns whatever action it is that you do, stop it. You change your mind, watch and see. Your actions can't help but follow because your body is controlled by the mind. Repentance is demanded of all people. What must I do to be saved? Confess the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. What do I say? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you come forward, I will phrase it in the form of a question, yes or no. Say yes, and we'll continue. Say no, and we'll sit down and talk a little bit more. If you say yes, that you do believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, you need to be and must be 
you're commanded to be, it is imperative. It's just as binding as believing, repenting, and confessing. You must be immersed in water, buried, totally covered by the water for the right purpose. The Bible teaches clearly that the purpose of immersion in water is for the remission of sins. To be added by the Lord to the church, Acts 2.47. And then brethren, been raised up to walk in newness of life. Walking in newness of life and walking in truth mean the same thing. If an apostle were to come into your house tonight, would he walk back out of there and say, I know that this brother, this family, is walking in truth. You can. Do what you need to do. Do it now. As together we stand. And as we sing the song of encouragement.